All right. Hi. Thanks for tuning in to my talk today. My name is Katie Souk, and I'm speaking to you from the rolling prairie of Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis near Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in Canada. So I was born and raised here on the prairie. I received my undergrad in anthropology and completed graduate studies in sustainable environmental management at the University of Saskatchewan. I'm a mom of three wonderful children and spouse to my partner in conservation, my husband Aaron. During my day job, I'm a human environment specialist with a local environmental consulting firm. And the rest of the time, I'm the co-owner and operator of the Restoring 71 Habitat Conservation Project. So I'm excited today to tell you our story of landowner-driven conservation, restoration, and education in our little patch of prairie during a global pandemic. So let's get rolling. So a little bit about our baseline conditions. So we're coming into 2020, we're in 2020, and our native prairie is an endangered ecosystem. So in Saskatchewan, we've eradicated over 85% of the native prairie that wants to find our province. Our wetlands are disappearing. So in settled areas of the province, it's estimated that we have filled in 70% of our original wetlands in Saskatchewan. Grassland bird populations have declined more than 50% in the last 50 years, and humans have lost their connection to nature and even in a province as rural as Saskatchewan, our children are forgetting how to connect to the land, how to be with nature. And if this all didn't seem dire enough, we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic. So welcome to 2020. While one would assume that our priorities would have shifted away from nature, as our schools, parks, and businesses closed late last March, what we experienced here at the Restoring 71 Project was just the opposite. Now hold on to that thought. Before I continue, I want to tell you a little bit about Restoring 71 in its pre-COVID days and how we designed the project to conserve the birds, protect the wetland, restore the grassland, and create space for reconnection to nature. So what is the Restoring 71 project? It's a habitat restoration journey. At a glance, it's a natural area located on 71 acres of tame grassland, wetland, riparian, shrub, forest habitats, as well as a tiny little corner of naturally revived native grassland. So what makes this project unique is that since the land was purchased in 2014, it's been a 100% landowner driven, funded and managed habitat conservation project. Why is this unique? Well, in Saskatchewan and in many parts of Canada, conservation efforts are done primarily by governments and conservation agencies. Conservation funding and partnerships are generally targeted to large-scale agricultural producers or are intended for use on publicly owned lands. So small-scale landowners like us, who are not interested in handing their land over to a conservation agency, at least not yet, have little to no options for significant funding or support. Because of this, there are very few landowners in our province who find themselves in a position to self-educate, self-fund, and self-manage their land for conservation and restoration purposes instead of for profit. So how did we get here? Well, in 2014, my husband Aaron and I bought 80 acres of abandoned annual crop and hayland to conserve and build a home on. We really had no idea what we were doing or where to start, but we knew that we wanted to raise our kids in the country. We knew that we were drawn to this land in particular because of the solitude, the 30 acre wetland, the wildlife, and the feeling that rushed over us when we felt the essence and wonder of this place. And we knew we wanted to hold on to it and share it with anyone who would listen, but we had no idea where to start. And so we sat back and we watched it and we learned from the land and <laughs> we just kind of hoped for inspiration. And we saw that this land is not just sitting idle. It's not waiting for us to make our move. It was active and it was growing all around us. Thousands of shorebirds and waterfowl would visit the wetland each year. Deer, moose, coyotes graced the yard often. The bluffs were alive with, a hundred of, with hundreds of birds each nesting season and the trees started to grow. The willows, aspens, poplars, cottonwoods, cottonwoods snowberries, chokecherries, New flowers bloomed each month in the native patch. It's like a new sea of color each time we visited. But it wasn't until three years later, the fall of 2017, after a chance sighting of a whooping crane, an endangered species in Canada, that we decided to formally launch the Restoring 71 project. 
Sometimes it just takes a five foot tall, bright white endangered species showing up nearly on your doorstep to really understand that what you have here is worth protecting. And if a whooping crane thought this land was worth a rest stop, what else might be here? We had to find out. And that was the beginning of the Restoring 71 project. So that fall, we launched a Facebook page and an Instagram account where we could share our progress on the project. And we did it through photography, video, and storytelling. We regularly feature a lot of my husband's lovely photos, like a lot of those that I've selected in the slideshow. In early 2018, we publicly committed to restore and conserve 71 of the 80 acres, hence restoring 71, uh, at a local conservation conference where we introduced the project. And since 2018, we've made some great progress on the site using mostly passive restoration methods, so letting it grow, with some key strategic small scale native tree grass and flower plantings, mostly to help expand our native patch again. So later that year, we opened up our far, four kilometers of intertwining mode trails to the public. And between the fall of 2018 and spring of 2020, so earlier this year, we'd hosted over 50 people on the site, which at the time was very exciting because what we were doing was really unusual. It's not normal for people on private land to open up their land to strangers, complete strangers. So people were a little cautious about it. Uh, but one of the challenges we faced when launching the project, uh, you know, like aside from finding the time and funding to teach ourselves ecological theory and species identification and keep the project moving while also working full time and raising three young children, was that despite the endless Google searches, I never did find an example of a private protected area model that we could base our project on. In our experience, it felt like we, at least figuratively, were inventing the wheel. This is largely because in Saskatchewan, only individuals with conservation easements on their land can have their conservation lands recognized as a private protected area under the IUCN definition. While we would have loved a how-to guide for developing our own self-funded, self-person-powered conservation and restoration project, starting from scratch and designing it as we went has really allowed us endless opportunities and flexibility um, so that we could be creative and to really cater what we're doing out here to what the ecosystems on the site, the wildlife, the plants, and the people in our community most need from our project at any given time. So at the beginning of 2020, we presented an update on the project at the very same conference where we committed to conserve and restore the land two years earlier. And at the time, our pre-COVID goals were really about adding more strategic planting sites, maybe some strategic disturbance, expanding our native patch further, making a plan for invasive species management, and trying to raise awareness about the project and what a do-it-yourself private protected natural area could look like. And then this brings us back to March of 2020, the month that COVID-19 arrived on the prairies. So within a two week span, our school shut down across the province. Several businesses were forced to close, many of which never opened again. Then it was our parks, our playgrounds and public trails around the city were closed off with yellow caution tape. Strict social distancing measures were in place in all of our public spaces. I remember the day that they made the announcement to the schools, childcare, about the schools, the childcare and parks. And I looked at Aaron and I said, thank goodness that we're out here and we have the project and we have the trails because I don't know if I could have made it through this if we still lived in the city. And it was in that moment that we realized that there were 250,000 people just 10 minutes away from us with tiny little yards or no yards at all, who now had nowhere to go to escape the chaos or to find a hint of quiet to breathe freely. So since we were both extremely fortunate to be able to work from home through the lockdown, we decided that we we're going to open the trails and put some word out about it. So our trails are open by appointment. They're free to use. All are welcome. Just you and 71 acres to yourself. So we shared our post on Facebook and Instagram and my Twitter account. And we didn't have high hopes for drawing a lot of attention, though, because but it felt like it was at least our responsibility to put it out there and see what would happen. So it was in a way in a way, it was in the most uncertain of times, it was a way that we could give back to our community. So at the time, our social media following was only about 140 people strong. 
it was also March. So if you've ever been to the prairie, March and April are the time of year where things start to melt and then they freeze and then they melt. And then there's a surprise blizzard followed by t-shirt weather day where everyone lathers on sunscreen, pretends it's summer until it snows again later that day. So the trails were muddy and then they were icy and then they were covered in snow. So not the best time of year for hiking. But when we started seeing our poster shared in all sorts of places by people we'd never met, and seeing our reach surpass 4,000 people. And then people started messaging us and booking trail times. And we were receiving so many requests each day that we had to set up an automated appointment system just to help us manage the requests and ensure that there was only one family on the trail at a time. So there were a few days where we were trying to work from home, trying to help the kids with their virtual learning while accommodating six trail appointments a day with people on the waiting lists in April in Saskatchewan. I love this photo because this is one that we, this little snowman is one we found on the trails after people started coming. So the kids were building a snowman, snowman. It was very cute. So our social media following started to grow and people kept coming. Complete strangers. Some were interested in the project itself and the way that we're restoring the land, but most people just need a place to breathe, to let the kids run without worrying that they'll come within six feet of someone not in their immediate family bubble. Some were avid outdoorsy types, but most weren't. They craved the fresh air, the birds returning, the wide open spaces in the skies, and they thanked us from the bottom of their hearts. And that's how we knew that, we were, that what we were doing mattered, and that we knew that in a time of chaos, loss of control and fear, people felt the need to find peace and calm in and with nature. Some only visited once, and others visited every week if they could. And between March 21st of 2020 and May of 2020, when playgrounds and local public conservation areas reopened, 260 people had visited the trails for self, for private self-guided appointments. So with the parks reopened, um, the trails really slowed down, but it was a welcome change because we had about 200 trees to plant this year in our new eco buffer, invasive species to manage and restoration plots to tend to. So we were busy. Uh, we also had wildlife to monitor and new species to identify, and we ended up identifying new 17 new species over 2020, bringing our total to 132 wildlife species on the site. And while the traffic at the site certainly slowed down as other options became available again, interest in the project continued to grow, and people looking for a new place to explore kept finding us and visiting. We also started to notice others replicating our nature by appointment model as outdoor spaces and businesses started to reopen, which was very flattering. So after the whirlwind between March and August of this year, we were looking forward to things slowing down a bit further as fall arrived and kids headed back to school. And it was in early August, however, that our government announced that parents could choose between the option of sending children to school in person, signing up for teacher-led distance learning, or registering kids for parent-led homeschooling. And in all three learning situations, outdoor learning opportunities were strongly recommended by our healthcare professionals. We wanted to figure out a way that we could help parents and teachers find outdoor learning opportunities. And so we developed the outdoor classroom at Restoring 71. The lovely thing about our outdoor classroom space is that aside from the obvious function, was that the space also serves as a restoration plot. So this poplar bluff or stand has been, had been flooded about eight years ago and it was taken over by invasive sow thistle. We mowed down the south thistle and seeded the area with native grasses and forbs. By keeping the area mowed, we'll apply stress to the tame grasses and annual or biennial invasive species and create more, import, more opportunity for diverse short grass prairie species to sprout in their place. Since establishing the classroom space, we've noticed an increase in birds interacting with the space. And we assume it's because grasshoppers and caterpillars are likely more visible and the birds are busy preparing for their fall migration. We didn't know if it would get much traction, but it was an easy space for us to maintain and it was there free of charge if people needed it. And then at the end of August, a local news outlet heard about our classroom and asked to interview us as part of their back to school feature. After it aired, we had teachers and preschools and daycare providers and parents contacting us left, right and center to learn more about the project. Teachers and principals were booking trail times to come and check out the classroom, and not long after our 15 minutes fame was up, we started noticing schools creating their own outdoor classrooms and learning spaces right on the school grounds, and like just fantastic to see that happening. 
So during the last week of September, just two weeks after the kids were back to school full time, we hosted our very first classroom on the trails. So this group of 25 sixth graders were preparing to learn about human interactions in the environment as part of their curriculum requirements. And as a human environment specialist by trade, I was more than happy to mask up and share a bit about the way that human actions have both the power to destroy or enhance biodiversity, depending on how we care for the land. So many of the students who came, they'd never seen a wildflower or native prairie. They had never harvested their own seeds. They'd never seen a wetland basin with, without water in it or knew why they need to protect a dry wetland basin with just as much passion as we do those with water. And while it was just a sneak peek into the world of conservation and restoration, it was a start and we were thrilled to be part of facilitating the beginnings of a lifelong connection to nature. In this photo, they they found a badger hole so they were all very interested <laughs> in, in what could be in there. So that's just a bit of a sneak peek into some of the adventures we've had here at Restoring 71 this year. But what about the takeaways? So Restoring 71 started as an idea and it evolved from there, taking on a life of its own. And if you have an idea and it just feels right, I encourage you to throw it out into the world and see what comes back. We are just two people with minimal ecological training. We're self-taught ecologists and land managers. And if a social scientist and an electrical engineer can do it, anyone can. The only prerequisites needed to make positive changes and enhance biodiversity, whether you have a thousand acres to work with or just a little space for a pollinator pod on your balcony, is the desire and will to do it. You know, the best teaching I received about native plants was that there's currently hundreds of thousands of native plant seeds sitting in the soil at any given time, waiting for the perfect conditions to take root and bloom. Some species wait for the right conditions for decades, and sometimes it takes a bit of patience for the conditions to be just perfect for a great idea to take root. So hang in there. The Restoring 71 project for us is about creating new opportunities to fill in the gaps. The gaps are ever changing, so creating a private protected area framework that can adapt to respond to the needs of our changing environment, our climate, and our need for connection to the land is essential for our project success and sustainability, but during and during the pandemic and beyond. You know, a lot of people ask us, what do you get out of this? Well, nothing. So like you do this out of the kindness of your heart. Yeah, but we also do it because we're given the honor of caring for this little patch of prairie and we want to do it in a good way. And we want to demonstrate for others that it is possible, even if our funding systems and governments aren't set up to recognize privately protected lands, the conservation and restoration of these endangered ecosystems and the species that rely on them are everyone's responsibility. And if we all do just a little bit, whatever is within our means at any given time, we have the opportunity as a collective to make real positive change from the grassroots up. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your time and attention and a big thank you to the organizers of the Biodiverse Festival, not only for creating such a wonderful and welcoming platform, but for allowing me to share our story. I look forward to answering any questions that you have. Uh, and here's some contact information. So if you think of questions after the question period is closed or just want to stay in touch or follow our progress, uh, be sure to look us up. We also love making new connections. So if you're doing similar work, similar types of work, we'd love to learn about it. So thanks again for tuning in and I hope you all have a wonderful day.